So I know I have just a few minutes left. Um, so I'm going to skip over some of this and get to the point that I'm more interested in. Um, but I'll very briefly say that I was going to look into business. I was going to talk about technocratic policy. I was going to talk about uh, planet of humans. Uh, sorry, planet of the humans. I was going to talk about the BRI as well. So the Belt and Road Initiative and why consumption keeps growing. I want to get us to other concepts of what it might, what we could think about. Okay. So this part for me is important because I think food security gets lumped so much into this idea of what is good for people with high yields and productivity. But there are so many other ways in which people connect to food that are much more about the human. So these are just some examples. The some of the best known examples of food sovereignty. So most of these examples go beyond policy. They focus on connection, place and autonomy. So this was a picture of the Chipko movement in India. Uh, if any of you know Vandana Shiva, she was one of the first women who went to a tree and she's known as a tree hugger. So she started the term tree hugging. She's the original tree hugger. So the Tripco movement was a group of women uh, who said we are going to, indigenous women who said, we're going to stand up against what the state wants to do and we will not let you tear down this forest. What was amazing about the Tripco movement is that it didn't stay in India. It actually went on to influence other communities in other third world countries. I use quotation marks of third world. So it went on to inspire Brazilians. Um, and, and then it spread to other, like the same idea, the same ethos spread to other parts of Latin America. Uh, the second concept, justice. Um, food justice tends to a bit different from food sovereignty, which was more about um, indigenous rights. Justice tends to have focused more on cities where the idea of indigeneity is not there, but you have like different types of people in a very heterogeneous, very diverse setting. So I want to show this cute video just like quickly because this is a grow food movement and I hope you can hear it. So this is by kids. Oh, okay, so all right, seems like you can't really hear the video. Um, okay, I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to show the full video, but you get a sense of it and I'll share with you a link afterwards. But a lot of this, so this video was really uh, okay, so I wanted to show this video to get to give you a sense of what like ideas of justice involve. It involves the question of representation and equality uh, in the way people have access to food. And in this case, it was about young black children or young black youth, not children, being able to have a stand in their community to say that we don't want any more shit that you serve up in McDonald's or like other fast food restaurants. We want to be able to have the space and autonomy to grow our own food, to pull up the cement from, from our, our land and grow something that nourishes us. And it's actually crazy that you would have young, young youth um, thinking that they wanted to grow vegetables uh, because the idea, the stereotype is that young people don't like vegetables. They will not eat vegetables, no matter what you do. The third example I wanted to raise is the idea of information. Um, so I'm a geographer, so I like maps. Um, but maps, are, maps and other kinds of information can tell us a lot about where 
people have access to types of food and what kinds of food and how much and whether there's clusters of people in different places. So the, there's many examples of this, but one really clear example I found was the Wisconsin Food Security Project, um, where they have different categories of things you can look for. And you can only show some variables and you can kind of search in the map for different spaces, uh, which is useful from a policy perspective. But it's also useful if you were a community member and you wanted to be able to go to your policy person and say, look, in this space, there's all this empty land, all this state land, and no one's using it. Uh, and I checked, I checked URA's map and it's not being used for the next 20 years. Uh, look at all these communities around. And so we can add on data points. We can say that there's like three to five room households around with people who have some time. And they all want to be able to grow something. So why don't we select a few plots and use these spaces? So that's an example of what information can do in the space between actual practice and making it possible to have that kind of like space for community to come in. So uh, I know I'm a bit over time, but can I go on for a few more minutes? Yes? Okay. Okay, a bit more. So I wanted to talk about this because, yeah, because uh, this is another concept. So when we think about what it means to be secure, like with food, we think so much about what's on the plate, like just that delicious bowl of whatever you were thinking about just now. But food actually is not just about that bowl. It comes from way be before that. And um, I have a lot of, I think I place a lot of emphasis on um, what comes before that, especially from the perspective of indigenous worldviews, because they have a very, not they, but different indigenous groups have relationships with food that go beyond what they finally eat at the end. And we are very impoverished as a urban, modern, 21st century kind of human when we can only consume what's on the plate. Uh, so this is a picture from SGCR's panel on the Chiang Mai forest fires, and they invited a Karen leader. So Karen, or some of you might know them as Pakanyo, and uh, they are known as forest protectors in Thailand, uh, known as in like their identity, their ethnic identity. They've managed to champion that as their ethnic identity. But they have different rituals when it comes to food. So they have the fire ritual. I can't explain to you what it is because I'm not Karen. They have the seeds ritual. And for this, I think I have some sense more than the fire ritual. I have a sense that it's... Uh, so both of these would be seasonal. There would be a point where they say it's time to um, either sow the seeds. I think in this case, it looks like they're sowing but how they do it and what belief systems they do it within, that is the real substance of the matter. It's not for us to say, oh, this looks cool. Let's like try to weave it in to what we're doing now. Um, it's not just a simple, like, let's pluck it from there and pull it in. So the concept around this for them is that if you are, um, if you're gonna, so here that they use forest fires as a way to, um, make sure that the leaf litter doesn't expand so much so that you have this blazing hot fire that comes every summer, which is happening right now. It's happening because the local Thai government, the national Thai government has told indigenous people no more forest fires. So the national body has overwritten indigenous knowledge and they're now facing the ecological impacts of that, which is uh, a lot of haze in Bangkok and Chiang Mai. The Karen also have this idea of 37 spirits. They are all different. Uh, there are spirits of different animals in the forest. There's also the spirit of the, the children that are tied with the trees. And this is the kind of connection that for me is the most important and that I want to 
try to help us think towards. So I'm not going to look in, I'm not going to look right at this image, but to say if we were to think about resilience, this buzzword that keeps going around, what does resilience mean? Does resilience begin just in food security, which is the first term that we come to, or does it begin in ecological identity? So to wrap up, uh, I want to come back to my thesis and present an idea. So this idea is again about locality. So I presented my proposal just now. So this is how I imagine it. Um, for me, the world is about interconnected circles and they expand outwards from me. Um, me because I inhabit this body, so I sometimes need help to see a different perspective. Um, but I was trained as a psychologist as well. And one of the things in psychology, uh, positive psychology, talks about self-determination theory. The idea of psychological flourishing, what does it mean to be well? Not happy, but well. At, at the best that you can be as a person, as a spiritual being. Okay. Wrapping up soon. All right. So this view says that we need spaces. We need to have connection to the, the world that is beyond just me and you and the food. We need to know the spaces, the people who are planting, the landscapes. We need to know the jokes as well. This man that you see here, uh, if you have ever visited the rice terraces in Bali, you would have seen him because he likes to he likes to pose for photographs for tourists and then you pay him a small amount. So that's like, it's, it's funny. Um, yeah, and ecosystems are more than just the separate segments we see them as. So there might be a waterfall that's right next to a rice terrace. Do we understand enough of our landscapes to know that what I do in this rice terrace is going to affect fresh spring water in a different part, like just right down, like maybe 500 meters from where I am? If we don't walk the land, we don't understand it, how do we know what our effects are? And that's, for me, I'm insecure when I don't know the land and I don't know if my actions in this space is going to affect something else. And the problem is, there is so little I know because our supply chains are so interwoven. So I will leave this here and um, uh, the full set of slides, including references, uh, will be made available to you. Okay, so that's all for me.